Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Marks, a psychiatrist, and I make mental health education videos. The American Psychological Association defines perfectionism as the tendency to demand of others or oneself an extremely or even flawless level of performance in excess of what is required by the situation. I like that definition because it focuses on perfectionism as a performance demand. It's not about attributes per se, meaning you're not hung up on having flawless skin. You're focused on the things you do to get what you have. There's a certain amount of healthy perfectionism and we call it perfectionistic strivings. If this is you, you're naturally more driven. You push yourself to be excellent and you set high goals for yourself. And you can even overdo it sometimes when you try to meet these goals by losing sleep or neglecting other obligations. But since you're not pathologically perfectionistic, you can rein in your perfectionistic strivings. You can accept falling short of your goals or accept things being good enough. You may be disappointed, but good enough doesn't chip away at your self-esteem. So what does pathological perfectionism look like? There's been a lot of research on this topic leading to the development of perfectionism scales that measure how perfectionistic you are. One such scale is the multidimensional perfectionism scale by Dr. Randy Frost. The scale uses questions to measure six facets of perfectionism. The first two are having concerns over making mistakes and having doubts about your performance. With these facets, you hate being less than the best at something. You measure yourself or you measure your self-worth by your ability to perform without making mistakes. You assume people like you more if you don't make any mistakes. And if you fail at something, you see yourself as a failure. The person with a healthy level of perfectionism can separate their failed performance from their view of themselves. Number three is setting high personal standards. With this facet, you aren't comfortable lowering the bar. The high standards feel natural and required. Number four is having high standards set by your parents. You feel your parents wanted you to be the best at everything. You may wonder, why should this be a problem if I'm out of their home? Because your parents don't need to be in your home. They live up here in your head. And even if you don't agree with everything they want for you, you still internalize their wishes. And what you do with those internalized wishes depends on your personality makeup. If what they want is in alignment with what you want, you adopt their beliefs and they become your own. If you're less prone to perfectionism, you can modify their wishes to make them a better fit for what you're capable of. If you reject their wishes, the conflict between what they want and what you want can turn into anxiety and neuroticism as you struggle to reconcile the two opposing views. I talk about what it means to be neurotic in this video. A fifth facet or aspect of perfectionism is experiencing your parents as excessively critical. You may feel like your parents never allowed you to make mistakes or you always had to outperform people to get their approval. The last facet is being over-focused on organization and order. And with this facet, being neat and orderly in all things is very important to you. A person with perfectionism may score high on some of the facets and low on others. The big three that predict more emotional and interpersonal problems are concern over mistakes, doubting your performance, and parental criticism. And I think the reason that these are the most impactful is because these are the ones that have the most direct impact on how you feel about yourself. Perfectionism can show itself in many forms. It can be a part of a personality disorder like obsessive compulsive personality, avoidant personality, and narcissistic personality. But it can also be underneath the surface of anxiety and depression. Think about it. If you're anxious and insecure, you can defend against those thoughts and emotions by making sure that things are just so or aiming for perfection to reassure yourself that you're capable. Restarting a project and redoing it until it's right can decrease your fear of being rejected or criticized. Interestingly enough, the compulsive checking with obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD can be driven by some perfectionism, but it's not always the root cause. People with OCD 
use checking to reduce anxiety related to an obsession. For example, I may need to count these ceiling tiles 15 times to offset my fear that my house is gonna burn down. Stopping at 14 is unacceptable, not because I'm perfectionistic, but I have it set in my head that it takes a full 15 times to prevent whatever disaster I'm worried about. OCD obsessions can be very rigid like that, but the rigidity is not perfectionism that stems from a distorted self-concept. Another place we see perfectionism is with the eating disorders like anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. And so that makes it important to address perfectionism as a treatment issue. And lastly, perfectionism is a hidden villain behind procrastination. Because you need things to be perfect and you will work overtime to make it so, you may avoid committing to things or put off starting something because you know that once you jump in, you're all in. And sometimes it's a burdensome commitment. What can you do to help your perfectionism? Perfectionism is so multidimensional that there's not one approach. What helps you depends on what facets of it affect you the most and what purpose the perfectionism serves. Does it mask anxiety or depression? Is it a way to compensate for low self-esteem? Is it a way to feel in control? Figuring this out takes some self-reflection and a therapist can help you recognize your perfectionistic tendencies. And that brings me to today's sponsor of this video, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a platform that will match you with a therapist for a very reasonable flat monthly fee. You can have a weekly virtual meeting with your therapist and send messages or ask questions every day if you want to. They have group webinars on general help topics and you get an online journal with daily prompts that you can share with your therapist. Check out my sponsored link in the description for 10% off your first month. Some of the goals of therapy for perfectionism are exploring your strengths, improving your self-esteem, and developing more balanced thinking. If you don't have a therapist, I have some free tools to get you started. One is my self-esteem video that includes a strengths exploration worksheet that you can download. The download links are in the description. Number two is my video on identifying self-defeating thoughts. I explain eight common distorted thoughts that anyone can have, and these include beliefs that keep your perfectionism going. Two distorted beliefs that I didn't discuss that are associated with perfectionism are ignoring the positive and labeling. With ignoring the positive, it's as though the only thing you see are flaws. You overlook any and all positive attributes of something, and one less than perfect item takes up your entire field of view. With labeling, you label your identity based on your failures. So if you make a mistake, you're a loser. Instead of seeing yourself as a capable person who happened to have lost this time and accept that you just all, you won't always get it right. The cognitive restructuring exercise helps you recognize these thoughts and patterns and build flexibility into your belief system. The third tool is my video on two ways to challenge your thoughts. And that video comes with a thought record and a cognitive restructuring exercise. The worksheet is one of many ways to challenge or restructure your thoughts to make them more flexible and adaptive. So those are the three resources to help get you started. Now go forth and transform. Thanks for watching. See you next time.